Well, here we are. <laughs> Dr. Stedman, Dr. Modi here in Southampton. Hello. Uh, pleasure to be invited to talk to you today about our role in helping patients with uh, liver metastatic disease from ocular melanoma. Uh, you're going to have to put up with one of my passions, which is cycling. Uh, this is us cycling up Von 2 last year, and there'll be a few cycling analogies as we go through, which I apologise for. Okay, so the first thing to do, I think, is to establish what we want to get out of today. And I think we want to get out of today an understanding of the biology and the natural history of ocular melanoma, because it is different from other cancer types. Then to look at some of the literature, and there's not much about how to manage this disease specifically in the liver, and then to chat about what we do here in Southampton and how we manage patients with liver metastatic disease. So as a starting point, I'm sure you've heard a lot of this over the last couple of days, ocular melanoma is different from cutaneous melanoma. So much that they both derive from melanocytes, uh, they have very different biology. So when you get a skin melanoma, that's a, a lump on the skin, if it's gonna spread, it'll spread to local lymph nodes and they'll often be in the groin or the axilla. Uh, and that pattern of spread is very predictable. The difference with ocular melanoma is the eye uh, or the globe of the eye doesn't have any lymph nodes. So when the tumours spread, they spread almost uniquely to the liver. And it's the liver disease and the progression of the liver disease that sadly uh, makes people unwell and often leads to their demise. So in terms of the primary, so that's where the, the tumour starts. Uh, as interventional radiologists, we've got a simplistic view. We see the, the symptoms as analogous to having a bad hangover. And I'm not going to belittle it but uh, we're not gonna go any further. You'll have heard other lectures about the primary. How you manage the primary, we've got a lot of evidence for that from the North American group, the comms group, and they will talk to you about the different ways you can manage the tumors. But what matters actually if you're a patient is what's gonna happen next. You've had the tumor in the eye dealt with, you've had radiotherapy, you've had plaques, you've had a nucleation, but what all patients want to know is will this come back? Will this affect how long I live for? And to know that, we go back to the basics of all cancer types, and that's how big the tumour is, where the tumour is. But most importantly, at this tumour type, it's about the analysis of the chromosomes. So it's all about the biology at the genetic level. And if you've got bad genetics of the tumour, then the chance of it coming back is significantly greater. And that's important because if it's more likely to come back, then we need to be looking for that disease coming back so we can manage it early. So this, this Liverpool scoring system, which will give you a very active predictor of whether or not that tumour is going to come back. And once you know that, you can plan the future. You can plan whether or not it's worth having surveillance. Now, Dr. Modi did some of the work on this about working out which is the best way of making sure uh, you haven't got disease in the liver. And it's unlike other cancers where we're looking everywhere. So if you've got breast cancer or bowel cancer, we're looking in your bones and your lungs, as well as the liver. With liver disease, we're really just looking down at that one organ. And the most sensitive and the most accurate test for liver disease is MR. So as we'd say in radiology, a bit like these two bald eagles, I don't know if they're American eagles, but these two bald eagles, one of them says, Julian, you're cheating. Hence the, uh, we won't go into the Armstrong analogy, but from a liver perspective, melanoma contains iron and iron is very well seen on MR studies. So we can see tiny deposits of melanoma in the liver using MR. So if you're gonna be screened, you wanna be screened with MR. And if you're going to go into details, it's probably good enough to have the MR scan without having the contrast because the contrast over years can damage your kidneys. Good. Well, people sometimes say, why are we bothering looking for tumours? Because once you've detected them, the outlook is bleak. What I'd like to show you is that that's changed over the last few years. We've now got much better treatments available, and therefore it is important to pick up tumours early. And so to give you an idea of how we can treat the liver, we're going to go back to our plumber's guide. So we see ourselves as upmarket plumbers. Uh, this is the, the liver vasculature. This is the tree of blood vessels to the liver. The little red uh, blood vessel running up here is actually the liver artery. So I don't know if you can see that, that's the liver artery, which is a very small vessel compared with this big blue pipe. And the big blue pipe is the portal vein. That's bringing the goodies back when you've had coffee, had breakfast, had your lunch. All the stuff comes back up the portal vein from the gut 
to the liver. And it's that big blood supply that the liver likes. The great asset we have is that tumours get all their blood supply from that small vessel, from the artery. So tumours are above the line here. They're getting all their blood supply from the artery. Healthy liver is down this end. So healthy liver or even regenerative nodules get their blood supply mostly from portal vein. So if you damage the portal vein blood supply to the liver, you damage healthy liver. But if you damage the arterial blood supply to the liver, you have a much, much bigger effect on tumours. And that's the tumours Achilles heel, and that's the weakness we use as our asset. So this is a diagram showing a tumour and showing its blood supply. And what you can see is successful tumours are successful because they grow all these new blood vessels. That's what happens when a tumour is growing. If it can't develop new blood vessels, it dies. So successful tumours, and that's obviously bad news for patients, are the ones that develop all these new blood vessels. And we know the density of those blood vessels is hugely greater in tumours than in normal liver. And that's the, that's the target we're aiming for. We're aiming to damage that new blood supply by putting particles in there. Now, you might ask us, what particles? What you want to do, first of all, is look at the pattern of disease in the liver. So what we like to see are a few growing lumps in the liver. These black areas are all areas where there are tumours growing in the liver, and they're black because they've got a really rich blood supply. If we see that, we know that we can treat those tumours well. But the question is, which is the right treatment? And people are always asking us, which is the treatment we should go for once we've got liver metastatic disease? And the reality is there are three options on the table at the moment. And going back to my cycling analogy, there are three generations of technology. And as the generations have moved forward, so has the treatment and the success of the treatment. So in terms of looking at how the treatments work for chemoembolization, that's blocking the blood supply with chemotherapy beads. We use really big beads which stop the blood getting to the tumour, so they cause the tumour damage through ischemia, so that's losing its blood supply. And then you're soaking the tumour with chemotherapy. When we talk about radiation, so radioembolization, the particles are an order of size small. They're much, much smaller, so they're not blocking the blood supply, but what they are doing is delivering a massive dose of radiation just to the tumours. So we'll look at those two technologies, and then we'll get Satchin to talk us through what is really the gold standard now in terms of uh, chemosaturation. So, this is my passion. This is one of my original, this is a 1950s Hetchins bike, so a very original English bike made in London. Uh, this is us out in Italy. Uh, there's a famous race out there on the chalk roads uh, every summer, so I love that. And this is a sturdy, reliable bike. We know what it does. And the analogy would be with taste. We know exactly what taste does. So this is a patient with a big tumour at the top of their liver. Uh, they were in their 80s, living alone, and the liver surgeons didn't want to resect it. So we initially treated it. This is our catheter right up into the tumour, and we injected a big dose of radiation. This is the radiation within the tumour, very high dose, and the tumour treated well. But then a year and a half later, it started to come back again. And we're not keen on retreating with radiation. So we decided here to use chemoembolization. We knew we could get into the blood supply of the tumor. And two and a half years later, you can see the tumor is well treated. It's well defined and the patient's well. So in terms of the patient journey, we've managed to keep that tumor under control. And we've used two technologies, the, the radiation and the chemotherapy bees to do that. But the evidence for chemoembolization is limited. So there have been lots of small papers looking at the role of chemoembolization. And actually, the survival for these patients isn't great. So the, the highest number of, or the longest survivals out to all is about 20 months, but this is a very selective group. So the role of chemoembolization is limited for patients with ocular melanoma. The next step up, we would say, is this is my DeRosa, this is my climbing bike. This is us climbing Von 2. We climbed it three times in a day, so we joined the Madman Club. So radiation is the second step up. So this time, this is a human hair. These are the radiation beads. So you can see they're tiny. They're not gonna block blood vessels. And what they are is incredibly powerful radiation. They're beta radiation, which is a very local uh, dose of radiation. It's actually a particle. Uh, for those who can still remember their physics from college, it's an electron. 
And this is how it works. We get a dose in a valve, we inject it through the valve, through this bit of tubing into a catheter, and that catheter's up in the liver. And here you can see the catheter. These are blood vessels, sorry, these are, these are blood cells, red blood cells, but you can see the particles that we're injecting are even smaller than that. So this works by delivering a massive dose of radiation inside the tumor. The advantage of that is that you can get good liver control uh, and with very minimal symptoms. So this is uh, actually Leslie who set off ocular melanoma treatment in the UK. She was an amazing patient advocate and did more than anyone else in the UK for moving forward this sort of treatment paradigm for patients. This was her back in the newspaper in 2011 after we treated her with CERT, with CERT to the right lobe of her liver. And what's important is not the patient journey, but the fact that up until 2016, she remained incredibly well. So what CERT allowed her to do is to have control of her liver disease. It didn't get rid of her liver disease, but it allowed her to live with her liver disease uh, and maintain a good quality of life. And that's all we can ask for. So we're getting up to almost modern times now. If we look at the data on radioembolization or CERT, what we know is it's well tolerated, so patients don't get many symptoms. We know we can do it for patients that aren't fit, so they're not cardiac fit enough to have chemosaturation. And we've done it before where we've done chemosaturation after we've done CERT, but we restrict CERT really for patients that we don't think are fit enough to have uh, chemosaturation or Delca. So here we go, that's my beauty, that's my Colnago C6, that's my favorite bike. And the analogy here would be with chemosaturation. And we've been doing this for a bit surgically, and the idea surgically is you isolate the liver using clamps and bypasses, and then you can infuse chemotherapy. But obviously that's a massive undertaking surgically, and if it works well, no one's gonna want you to do it again because the morbidity of having major surgery would mean that the idea of having another treatment wouldn't be great. And yet that's what we do with cancer treatment. If it works well, we like to repeat it. So that was the limitation of doing it surgically. And that led to the concept that you could actually isolate the liver and you could treat it percutaneously. You could treat it through the blood vessels uh, without all the morbidity of having major surgery. And that's where my colleague Sachin comes in, who's the expert in chemosat. So I'm gonna hand over to Sachin and ask him just to talk you through just some of the technical aspects of how we do it and then think about what that means for patients. So yeah, so um, chemosaturation is a procedure that we've been doing here in Southampton for about eight years. Um, it's different to the other treatment options that Brian mentioned, but it relies on the same, uh, same nuances of the differences in the liver uh, blood supply. So by using this technique, we're able to give an extremely high dose of chemotherapy, which is called melphalan, to affect the liver tumors via the arteries. But at the same time, we are able to isolate the liver blood supply coming out of the liver, the veins, in order to capture any chemotherapy that's left over. This means essentially we're able to bathe the liver and the liver tumors in this uh, very powerful chemotherapy agent which we have found to have had the greatest effect on the liver tumors compared to some of the other techniques mentioned previously. So it involves three stages, so isolation of the liver, saturation with chemotherapy, the blood which has the chemotherapy comes out of the body, goes through this filtration circuit and goes back in through the neck. So the procedure is performed sort of percutaneously, minimally invasively, with two tubes in the groin and two tubes in the neck. This is a picture of us uh, performing the procedure here in Southampton. It does involve a, a reasonably big team. This, this lady here at the bottom is a perfusionist who's managing the circuit with the blood going through the filter here. And uh, we have an anaesthetist involved who controls the patient's blood pressure, which does go up and down during the procedure. This is some pictures of the balloon that we put up to isolate the uh, blood supply. Um, and um, this is a picture here which shows, the, shows nicely the hepatic veins of the liver which drain into this catheter. This is the blood we then suck out from the liver which has the chemotherapy in it. So just show me, Sachin. So you've got a balloon at the top there in the heart. The balloon at the top in the heart pulling down into the IVC which is the big blood vessel which drains all the venous blood back to the heart. Yep. And this bottom balloon here is a sort of stabilizing balloon which sits just above the renal veins, the kidney veins, and this is, isolates the, uh, the, the blood coming out of the liver. Okay. 
So this procedure is done under general anesthetic, as I said, because we're blocking the main blood vessel going back to the heart. There are some fluctuations in blood pressure. In order to make sure the blood flows nicely through the filter, we need to make the blood very thin. So we give medication to make the blood very thin, uh, and this prevents blockage of the filter. Um, one of the benefits of this technique, as I said, is the melphalan, we're able to give a very high dose uh, to have the maximum effect within the liver. Uh, patients, after we finish the procedure, we deliver the drug for about 30 minutes, during which time the blood is being washed out. Once we finish delivering the drug, we wash the blood out for another 30 minutes to make sure we've absolutely got rid of all the chemotherapy. And then we give things to reverse the thinning of the blood before we take the tubes out. So I might just have a quick mention of where we're at in terms of evidence, because I think that's important. Now, the only evidence we have at the moment is old data from using the old filter type. And this was the focus study. This is the trial in North America primarily, which had patients with eye cancer and a few with skin cancer. And as we do in trials, we split people into two groups. One group was having the treatment, so that's PHP or percutaneous hepatic perfusion. And one group was having best alternative care. So they were having any other treatment their team thought was right. The problem with this trial is that when patients progressed, we had this crossover. So the red line here is showing you that patients that had best alternative care, when their disease got worse, which it predictably did, they then went on and had the same treatment. So the problem is there weren't enough patients who had um, no treatment to make a difference in the two groups. So when we look at how long it takes before patients progressed in their liver. If they didn't have PHP or chemosat, they progressed very quickly within two months. If they had chemosat, then the mean was eight months. So there was a big difference, even with the old technology, in how well controlled the liver disease was. And all you can ask a, a liver-directed therapy to do is control liver disease. So I think it shows that even though this trial was taken to be negative, it did show that it did what it was meant to do on the TIM, which is to control the liver disease. And when we look at survival, even the original treatment arm uh, trial with the old filter showed that there was benefit to patients. But this is my cycling analogy back to the uh, Sky team. This is uh, uh, showing you that actually the Sky team have made their sort of niece this idea that they make tiny little differences. And those tiny little incremental differences all add up over time. And those um, little differences then make big differences. So they've even here, you can move, they've moved the bike computer back a couple of millimeters so it's less turbulent flow. They've got these special shirts uh, that have um, different flow across them. So this is uh, Froome and Grailsford. Uh, so they really demonstrated that tiny differences all added together make a big difference. And that's what we've done at Southampton. We've worked really hard on this technology as a team and we've worked to try and improve our outcomes. So where are we at, Satch? And this is our data with Moffat, isn't it? Yeah, this is our data from uh, four years ago uh, with the new filter, um, which shows increased survival uh, in patients with uh, liver-dominant uh, metastatic disease with ocular melanoma. Um, so you can see by these complicated but graphs that basically the over, overall survival the patients had and the control of the liver disease that they had. So if you look at the, the red and the blue here in this top right hand graph indicating stable disease or some sort of response in the liver was significant. And if we move on to this sort of waterfall chart, we can see that on the right hand side, so all the colours apart from red, we can see all those patients uh, in this subgroup had a response to treatment. So each one of those bars represents an individual patient? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and so the, below the line, the green means those tumours have responded. Exactly, yeah. And obviously there have been some patients, the red, which have not responded or got yeah. worse. So the vast majority have done very well. Okay, and I can see there's a, there's a patch there where it's not measurable, so those weren't analysed effectively. Because Absolutely. Of, okay. In terms of where you're at now, I mean, what's changed over the last three or four years? I've not done so many recently yet. <laughs> How have you found treating patients? What's been the difference? So we, we're now eight years in to our chemosaturation program. We've got a great team here of anaesthetists, perfusionists, nurses, radiographers, who are all geared to providing a very efficient service. We've treated 100 patients now. Uh, we've done nearly 300 different treatments of uh, chemosaturation treatments. Uh, we've treated patients from all around the world. And they're all ocular melanoma? All ocular melanoma with predominantly 
liver disease, liver okay. exotic disease. And, you know, we found over this time period that, you know, things have definitely improved. You know, patients are tolerating the procedure much better. You know, when we first started, patients were going to ICU, they were staying for five, six days in hospital. You know, patients are now going home within two days, uh, getting back to their normal daily activities much better. I was speaking to a patient just yesterday and she said that, you know, she's back to gardening, back to doing, back to walking. You know, so patients really do like the fact that this procedure is tolerated tolerated well and they get back to their normal activities of daily living very quickly. I was surprised actually when the trial protocol came out for the latest trial, the idea was you were going to treat patients every six weeks and they would have six cycles of treatment six weeks apart. And that seemed to me incredibly intense in terms of the volume of treatment you're throwing at someone and the ability to recover from one treatment just before you get the next yeah. treatment. Well, I mean, if you think of normal chemotherapy, patients don't generally tolerate that intensive treatment. Yeah. Whereas the patients we treat in the trial, in fact, by the time it came to the sixth treatment, they were looking forward to seeing us. Um, so no, it is a very well tolerated procedure. We've had no major uh, adverse consequences uh, of doing this procedure. And you know, we, we, we've, we really are impressed with, with how well it's tolerated by our patients. I suppose that's a fair question. You've done 100. Anyone, any deaths? Or you say you've done 300 procedures? 300 procedures, no deaths within 90 days of the procedure. So we're, you know, okay. that, that for, for any procedure, given what we're actually doing, yes. I think if you think about the actual extent of the plumbing that we're doing, plumbing, the things that we're altering, yeah. you know, that really is fantastic. Yeah. Well, that's very different from the original focus study. Yeah, no, things, things have definitely improved. And, you know, we obviously, with time, have become better at doing the procedure. Good. So I was just going to, this is just a graph to see where it fits in. So what we would say is um, you need to stratify who's at risk of getting recurrent. So people at high risk because of their genetics or because of their tumour biology should then be screened carefully with six monthly MR, probably unenhanced MR, but we can argue about that. If you can then reset patients, if you can get rid of all the tumour when their liver disease is documented, that's clearly a benefit. But otherwise, we would recommend patients have chemosat uh, to try and control their liver disease. We've shown it's reproducible, we've shown their quality of life is excellent, and we've shown the safety profile is also excellent. And obviously, there's a lot of interest in immunotherapy. One of the problems is there's clearly a very big difference in the response to immunotherapy between patients with skin cancer and those with eye cancer. And sadly, patients with eye cancer, the response to immunotherapy is not nearly as good as it is with skin cancer. But there's still, you know, a lot of work being done in that area. So that's us. So I suppose this is a slide of our cancer charity with lots of patients and nurses and doctors all cycling to Paris. And I think what that shows is that actually teamwork is important. And actually for rare cancer types, people like Leslie Kirkpatrick, we mentioned earlier, patient advocates are probably more important in these um, cancer types, which are rare than any other area of medicine. And actually working together, doctors, nurses, patients, relatives, is the way we can improve the quality of life and the treatments that are available for, this, uh, for these groups of patients. And so I applaud the Americans for getting everyone together around the world, talking together, Ireland, Australia, North America, that's great. I think that's a really positive asset in terms of how we can move these treatments forward. So, We've overloaded you with cycle jargon. Um, what we've hoped to do is show that we feel in interventional oncology as, as upmarket plumbers, we think that we're now the fourth pillar of cancer care. So you have medical oncologists who use drugs, surgical oncologists or surgeons, radiation oncologists are the people that use radiation, external beam radiation to treat tumors, and we're the guys that go in via the blood supply and try and deliver a payload, whether it's radiation, whether it's chemotherapy, uh, or whether it's particles. We're both available. You can see our emails at the bottom. We're both delighted to chat if anyone's got any questions or uh, ideas about how we can improve services. And we're just delighted that you've given us this opportunity, you know, from Southampton to give you an update on where we're at. Thanks, Sachin. Thank you very much. I think I need a hat like yours, though. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Thanks, guys. <laughs>